This is Lori Labar. I'm a curator at the Maine State Museum, and I've been involved in reproducing a man's outfit from the 1700s with a group of artisans. And on this page, from left to right, are the artisans, and it includes Marion Sharoon on the left. We call her Tusi. In the front is Jennifer Neptune. She's a Penobscot bead worker and basket maker. And then I'm in the back. And then on the right side of the screen, behind the outfit, is Gal Frey, and she's a Passamaquoddy bead worker, and she and her whole family make baskets. And then on the far right is Rose Toma, and she is an elder in the Maliseet tribe, and there's absolutely nothing that woman can't make with her hands. She's really good. So this outfit, the original belongs to the New Brunswick Museum, and they gave us permission to reproduce it. It's only one of three such outfits that have survived in their entirety. There are just the, the capes, the, the mantles, a few of them survived too. And this is also the only one that's Wabanaki. Canada made a copy of this outfit in the 1980s. The original is so fragile and it's so heavily damaged by light that it can't be on exhibit for any long period of time. So the museum made a, a copy. And it was great because they did all these tests to figure out what the original color of the silk was and that sort of thing. And they were gracious enough to give us all of their data so that we could then work on it and we could get some clues to the original construction of the piece. We did the work in a room that was right off the Uncommon Threads Gallery so the public could come in and see what we were doing and talk to us about what we were doing. This is Gal Frey uh, working on a pair of leggings. And the leggings are made of wool, as is the whole outfit. And then they have silk applique ribbons and little extra diamonds of applied wool. And now she is making the little diamond shaped accents around the wool. You can see that we've turned under the edges of the silk because the kind of silk ribbons that they used in the 1700s are no longer available today. So we had to turn torn strips of silk and turn the edges under and hem them. The original silk ribbons, you just can't get that kind of ribbon today, not in the widths and the colors that were available. So we custom dyed all of the fabric to match the original fabric. Match coat's a word that probably meant clothing, and it refers to the mantle or the cape which is a big square of wool, red wool, called stroud cloth, um, and then it has silk ribbons that are being appliqued right now. And this is Tuzi doing the applique work. These original ribbons were absolutely beautiful. They had a strand of flowers woven into the center, and then they had three strands of silver thread woven into the edges. And at the end, we wove silver into ours as well. We threaded it through. We, didn't, we just embroidered it. It's been really fun working all of us together because we've come from really different backgrounds in terms of how we approach the work. And it's been a lot of fun trying to sort of come to the same conclusions about how to proceed on certain things. We've really let the outfit sort of guide us in a way, um, let things evolve. It's not an exact perfect inch by inch reproduction of the outfit, which would have been hard to do. I mean, we already had to make compromises with the types of ribbon. So it's a very close match, but it's not completely identical. It is its own thing. I think that the original owner would have been delighted by the results because these ladies really do just some superb work, and I really enjoyed the time that I got to work with them. Rose Toma is quite a sewer, and she's actually working on the most complex piece, which is the cap. All the other pieces are made of rectangles of fabric. So the only piece that isn't a rectangle is the cap, and it's all these sort of V shapes of fabric. And there's, I think, four different colors of silk ribbon on it, and there's ears, and then we put a little bit of a stiffener in the ears to make them stand up a little better. But it's by far the most complicated piece. Jennifer did sew the pieces together, and now um, Rose is applying the silk ribbon. This piece was the trickiest, too, because it was the only one where the silk had to go in a curve. So we had to kind of try and take up, ease the, the silk, because we didn't think about that ahead of time and do it on the, the diagonal. Um, I'm working on uh, the breech cloth and hemming the edges under on the side. 
and the breech cloth is a dark blue, very dark blue wool, and then with the strips of colored silk. And then eventually, I think it was Gal who wound up putting the beadwork on there. Here you can see the rough edge of the silk. We had to use just pieces of silk that we then ripped because um, that would give us fewer frayed edges than cutting. So I'm trying to turn this under so that you can't see that little raw edge and then I'll stitch it down. So we had to do that with all of the silk. And we were very lucky, a woman in Farmington who does a lot of fiber arts was able to give us matches of the fabric. And the fabric itself, we base the colors on the reproduction that was done by Canada. And Jennifer Neptune is working on the leggings, and you notice that the, the design on this pair of leggings is very, very different than the side that Gal was working on. However, um, each legging is like that. Each side of the legging has very, very different patterns. So I guess you could wear them, switch legs, and have whichever pattern you wanted face out. And there are the tails of silk. Uh, if you see on the lower part, right to the right of her hands, um, those were just floated free, and there's some at the top and some at the bottom. And at the end, we trimmed those down a little so that our fictional person wouldn't have tripped over their little tails. So right now, it looks like she's sewing down the wool. Make sure that size nice and clean before she makes another strip of beadwork along it. We talked about a lot of things when we were together. Um, it was a lot of fun, talked about different strategies, but we also talked about what the women who were working on this would have talked about in the 1700s, which was our families and how things were going in our daily lives, that sort of thing. And it was nice to think about who the original maker was and what she would have been doing or they would have been doing in the 1700s. This outfit dates to somewhere between 1760 and 1780. We talked about how lucky we were to have bright lights and, um, you know, a comfortable warm <laughs> room. You can see the heater in the back. It wasn't always warm. We had to warm it up. But we talked about what her life would have been like when she was making this, trying to make it probably in a wigwam without any lights. Maybe she made it in the summer and so she could work outside in the sunshine. It took a lot of time to do this. The, the beadwork was time-consuming, although it was pretty simple beadwork. These guys are very, very talented beadworkers and have done much more complex projects. The hat was the lone exception in terms of the complexity of it. But even so, it took a long time because everything, of course, is hand-stitched. And beadwork is very time-consuming, even when it's fairly simple. And there are, I think, 14 different strips of silk on this match coat. And they all had to get put on and you can see on the far right there's kind of this little red wavy line and that's the edge of the fabric and the fabric was woven white the edges were bound tight and then it was dyed so that the um, the very edges got covered with fabric and bound tight and then they didn't take any of the dye the linen didn't let the dye in the linen fabric wrap Tusi is very 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 careful She's a conservation technician that we work with, and she's worked on a lot of our projects and flags and things. So this was a different thing for her to be doing, and I wanted her on the project because she was around when we started the project. She was able to take the copy of the cap that was made in the 1980s and make a pattern from that. So there I am working on the, working on the beach cloth. The colors were just fabulous. On the original, they're pretty faded, but um, because the Canadians were able to um, do all the work and determine the original colors, we were able to work with this very bright silk. And the color combinations are just wonderful. The purple and the green and tan and gold. They had a lot of different silks available to them and they were really beautiful. This was a high-end outfit by Wabanaki standards of the late 1700s. It would have been worn with a linen shirt that had ruffled cuffs and a gorget, a metal ornament at the neck. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the New Brunswick Museum for giving us permission to recreate this outfit and the Kobe Foundation and the Davis Family Foundation for funding the project.
At the close of Uncommon Threads, when the exhibit is over, the outfit will be available for display at tribal cultural centers around Maine. We will be bringing the outfit to the different tribal offices this spring to show everyone what the artisans have been working on and to give them the first peek at the completed project.